before I begin, I'll, just a reminder that the fifth problem set is due on Wednesday. It's on UVA CoLab. Uh, it's, it's long, but it's, it's material that we've done in the past several weeks. So, so uh, it's review more than anything else. But it's still based on, based on people's, you know, it's worth doing. Back to the material, uh, where we are is, is, is in garden watering, the idea that, that the flow of fluids is more complicated than I discussed in the, in the context of balloons and water distribution. Fluids are, have, have complications to them. And uh, even without the complications, my, you know, what do I mean by not complicated? A fluid flowing in for example, steady state flow, which is the, sort of the simplest possible flow, stationary environment, you can't tell time is passing. Even in steady state flow, there are interesting effects that show up. I talked about all the conversions of energy from one form to another, and I uh, won't, won't redo that. But, but if you look at how a, no, uh, not a nozzle, a uh, faucet works, even, even with, with perfect steady state flow, the, the faucet is able to control how much fluid the water comes out of out of the faucet because you're you're making the water go through a, an opening, some some small opening. The water, the, the fastest the water can go through that, the most water you can get through per second, for example, is determined ultimately by the energy in the water, the ordered energy, I should say, that excluding thermal energy, which is another story. The ordered energy. If, it if the water turns all of its ordered energy into kinetic energy and goes as fast as it can through that opening, only so much can get through every second. It's basically a bottleneck, you know, literally. And um, the more pressure there is in the water upstream, that is, the more energy per drop there is in the water upstream, the faster it can go, the more water will come out of your faucet. So you had the experience that in a house that has low water pressure for some reason, uh, even when you open the faucet pretty wide, you give it a big, give the water a big opening to go through, you just don't get that much water through. It's limited by energy, you just can't go any faster. Uh, if you do boost the pressure up, then you get more water through. The water goes faster at that, at that narrow point. And just sort of as public service announcement type stuff, you, you, you've seen what happens when you go to very high water pressure and send it through a hole. Uh, you get uh, spray cleaning, what do they call it? Uh, <laughs> Is the name for this, like for washing houses and stuff. The power wash, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, you know, what, what's power washing? If you get the water pressure up to something on the order of 100 times atmospheric pressure, that's a lot of energy per drop. If you have it turn all of its energy into kinetic energy, which you do by sending it through a nozzle uh, and out into the open air, it comes out really fast, a couple hundred miles an hour. Uh, if you go higher still, you can get it coming out, I suppose you can get it coming out at supersonic speeds. They certainly use very high water pressure, way beyond power wash, to, to, to cut things. They can cut rock with it. They can cut metal with it. There are water jet cutters for metal. Some of the, some of the things that you get, it looked like they might have been cut with a laser. Well, yeah, lasers are actually more expensive than water jet cutters. They're water jet cutters, they use like 20,000 pounds per square inch uh, pressure, which is ab about, is that, it's over a thousand atmospheres, a thousand times atmospheric pressure. It's pretty high pressure. The water goes really fast. It's got a lot of energy per drop. It can it can cut holes in things, often facilitated by putting little grit in the in the water. So the grit comes out at this tremendous speed and cuts holes in things. So next time you get into manufacturing, you can use water jet cutters. All right. So back to the issue of faucets. Uh, so even in, the, in, in flow that, that's, that's perfect, that has no, uh, no, no turbulence and no viscosity, the water flow through an opening is limited by energy. But then there, is, there are these other real limits. Uh, viscosity, the syrupiness of, of, of any fluid, water included, makes it, it gives it uh, some difficulties flowing through a stationary structure because the water rubs against the water, rubs against the water, which ultimately rubs against the structure. And so the water anywhere in the flow is ultimately somewhat aware of the structure. And it loses energy. It wastes its ordered energy as thermal energy. Uh, so that's the issue of viscosity. Uh, we saw that if you, if you 
go out of the context of a faucet into the, into the world of a hose, that water can't coast through a hose. In the, because of viscosity, if there were no viscosity, the water could coast. It would be inertial. <laughs> Off it would go through a horizontal hose. Sad but true, water rubs against the walls by way of viscosity and, and against itself and ultimately slows down. So you have to push to keep it going. And I talked about how you have to, the, the, the bigger the diameter of the hose, the, the easier a time that the water has flowing through the hose. Any questions about that stuff? All right. So um, just to, to then to put to bed this question that I asked and I demonstrated that and you all know about that if you take a hose and you let the water come out of it un unobstructed, it, it, it typically comes out as a, as a relatively gentle stream, not all, moving all that fast. But if you pinch off the neck, the water sprays like crazy. Just make sure that everyone understands why that happens. It's because when the hose is open, it's basically, you can think of it as, as connected to the water company providing a certain pressure at the start and open to the air, giving it atmospheric pressure at the end, it's got a certain pressure difference across the whole hose. And in accordance with that, that law I told you last time, I guess I can flip back to it if I can find it, what's known as Poisson's law, this one at the bottom, the flow rate is just the pressure, the pressure difference between start and finish, uh, the hose diameter to this crazy one uh, fourth power, and the hose length and the viscosity. Basically, you're just seeing how much water will go through the hose, given a, a pressure difference of water company and, and atmosphere, let it rip. And a certain amount goes through. When the water leaves the end, it's basically used all of its ordered energy to fight its way through the hose as fast as possible, and there's nothing left. It comes out with, with gasping for breath, nothing else left. OK, so that's the open hose. The pinched hose is different. Now in the pinched hose, you are uh, slowing the water down. You're, you're dropping the pressure difference between the, the water company pressure and the pressure right inside your thumb. Right inside your thumb is almost water company pressure. There's a very little pressure difference between start and finish. That means very little water flows through per second. It's a, it's, now you've got a very slow flow. The proportion of wasted energy in that slow flow is very little. The fast, faster flows waste more of their overall energy. They, they waste 99%, say. Whereas once you pinch it off and you make the flow go slow, uh, it only loses a few percent of its, of its energy by, by in the rubbing process. This is a consequence of the fact that viscosity and viscous forces uh, increase with relative speed. The faster you try to move something past something, the more it fights. So uh, ultimately, the water retains most of its ordered energy in the slow movement through the plumbing, the hose, shows up just inside your thumb at almost full energy. And you, at the last moment, turn that energy by way of a, a thumb-based nozzle into kinetic energy. And out it goes, like crazy. All right? Uh, just as uh, random examples I haven't thought of for a long time. But, uh, you all know of the, of the the faster the water throws, flows through the plumbing, the, more, the larger fraction of its ordered energy it loses. You know this from the following example. You've been taking a shower, and somebody flushes one of the kawumpf toilets, and you get scalded. Is this familiar to people? You know, where did that come from? It's because the kawumpf toilet allows a huge amount of water to flow through the cold water pipes. And that sudden surge in, in water usage leads to more rubbing and a larger loss of, a larger fraction of the water's energy is suddenly lost in the plumbing. So what shows up at, at your shower head is, a, is, is hot water unaffected and cold water that suddenly loses some of its pressure, which is to say it, loses, it no longer has the energy it had a quarter of a second ago. So it's got less pressure. The hot water is still full pressure. The cold water is suddenly at lower pressure, having lost more of its, uh, its energy per drop because all the water is moving faster in the cold water pipe. So when they, when they mix together, you've got a much, uh, full, full pressure hot water, lower pressure cold water. You get more hot water all of a sudden. It, they, they merge together, and more hot water merges into the stream, being as how its pressure is higher. 
Does that, questions about that idea? Next time it happens, you'll know why it happens. All right. So that's the story then of, of, of why the hose sprays harder when you pinch it off. All right, now on to a, a, a one of the most important, ultimately, most important issues in fluid flows. That is, when fluid flows accelerate, their pressures change and vice versa. And uh, that's sort of a, some grand umbrella issue. But let me, let me show you a, a case of, of this sort of thing happening. Suppose you have water flowing through a hose. And let's work horizontally so we don't have to worry about gravity. So just nothing's going up and down. Gravity's uh, pulling the water towards the wall of the hose, which is perfectly happy to support the water. And gravity becomes uh, an unimportant part of the story. There is, however, water moving through the hose, and therefore it has kinetic energy. And for the moment, let's neglect viscosity, which you know, it's there and it's important. But if we, if we work uh, in, in, in a very limited area with, with wide open hoses, more or less, big hoses, uh, viscosity doesn't, isn't very important. So, so having just introduced viscosity, I'm going to set it aside again for the moment. If the water is, if, is going straight through the hose, uh, having neglected viscosity, its pressure is going to be constant. I told you before that if, the, if a hose has constant diameter all the way along, it can't speed up or slow down. And because this hose is horizontal, it can't change its the water can't change its gravitational potential energy, so the water can't change its kinetic energy because it can't speed up or slow down without causing traffic jams. It can't go up or down, so it can't change its gravitational potential energy. Then its pressure potential energy is going to be constant. So the pressure in a straight hose is, in principle, constant all the way along, neglecting viscosity, which is fine. What if you bend the hose? So in this case, the hose makes a right turn. And, and so just so everybody's on board with what this picture is showing you, here's the hose. We're looking down on it from above. It, the water is flowing this way. And it would have gone straight if, if the hose hadn't had a bend in it. But here's the bend heading off to our right. Not too complicated. Well, just think what happens if you first send the water down this hose so that the, the, what, the blue, forget the colors in here, just let the water start here at the beginning. We're watching the start of the story. This water wants to be inertial and go straight through like that, but the hose won't let it. It hits the, it hits the outside surface of the hose. This I'm going to call the inside because it's the inside uh, part of the turn. If, if you're making a turn, the turn around like that, the inside is, is my shoulder. The outside is my fingers. Just a name stuff. So the water hits the outside of the hose. And, and you can sort of think of it as piling up there, at least briefly. And so it shouldn't be too surprising. The pressure might rise there. So just to give you a, a, a feeling that well, yeah, maybe there is a high pressure on the outside. Well, if you let the flow continue and evolve into steady state flow, so initially, it's not steady state. If you, if you can see the water coming down the pipe, that leading edge of water, it's not steady state, because you can tell time is passing, violating the rules. But if you let, it, let, the, let that leading edge go by, let the water flow for a second or two so everything settles down, then it's steady state flow. You can't tell time is passing. The hose is not moving. Everything follows the rules. Uh, you don't pay attention to the whole world, because somewhere out here, there's a source for this water. And somewwhere out here, there's a place for it to go. Those are probably going to be messy. But in our little part of the world, that bend in the hose, life is simple. And these lines represent the streamlines, the paths that a drop will take. So a drop that, that, that is right here where my green dot is located at, uh, at, at time, one, time zero seconds, say, might be here at time one second, might be here at time two seconds, and so on. And every drop that passes through this point will eventually follow that same path, that same streamline. So here are a half a dozen, well, eight or something, or 10 streamlines, potential paths that a drop can take through the hose. All right, Any, anything at this point? Class, class? OK. So. When everything settles down, there are the streamlines going by, and some weird things have happened. There is a region on the outside of the turn where the pressure is high. And my convention, 
you know, I don't know that anybody else has this in the world, but, but this is my convention for, for, my, for what I, wherever I've written about this stuff. Or, or my, my convention is to use the colors of the rainbow to represent pressures with the violet end of the spectrum corresponding to high pressures. And this is just, just trying to illustrate. This is, this is a high pressure region here in the violet end. And oddly, on the inside of the turn, we're at the red end of the rainbow spectrum. That's low pressure. So, so I'll explain why this is the case in a minute, but just, just be OK here. here that, that the water entered the hose in the blue, which, I, which I, I'm saying is, is, is medium pressure, nothing special. It's coming through at blue. And as it goes around that bend, the outside portion of the water goes to high pressure, namely violet. The inside portion goes to low pressure, namely red. You okay with the colors of the spectrum? Is that, okay? is that all right? Uh, at the same time this is happening, you'll notice the spacing between the streamlines varies. Here at the beginning, they're all evenly spaced. That is drops that, are, that, were, that were let out uh, uh, an inch apart, one inch apart, one inch apart, one inch apart. They all stay one inch apart. But as they go around the turn, those streamlines shift their spacing. The drops. That the stream lines on the outside of the turn are actually wide, more widely s separated than they used to be. They're not an inch apart anymore. They might be an inch and a half or two inches apart. They have spread out. And what that means is the water is now passing, is a, is a, has created for itself a widening environment, as though it were going through a diffuser. Remember diffusers are the opposite of nozzles. They, they spread the a flow out. And when you spread a flow out, steady state flow, its kinetic energy decrease, uh, it, it slows down, it, it loses kinetic energy, and its, it, its pressure potential energy rises, its pressure goes up. So when you send, when you send air, like your hair dryer through a diffuser, it slows down, and its pressure rises. Same thing's happening here. There's no visible diffuser, but it's happening anyway. The, the streamlines are spreading out like they're going through a diffuser, and they're slowing down. The, the, the water is slowing down. And the pressure is rising. And the pressure rising is consistent with what we just saw. It's purple out here. Uh, and lest you think this is you know, just fun and games with math or something like that. No, it's real. This is, if you go in there with a machine and sample that, the pressure really is higher. And the water really is, slowing, is traveling more slowly than anywhere else in the flow. On the inside, where the streamlines are bunched up, it's like they've created a nozzle for themselves. They are squirting together, speeding up, going faster. Um, and they have converted pressure potential energy into kinetic energy. They are, the pressure's dropped, and the speed has increased. So this is, this is high speed, low pressure water relative to the normal hose stuff. And outside here, this is low speed, high pressure water. And these effects are real. Uh, for example, if a hose is going to burst, because of excessive pressure, it's most likely to burst right here on the outside of that turn. Uh, this, you know, alas, in, in, in humans, the same thing happens. We occasionally have burst pipes. Uh, they're called, uh, uh, and here, here, before I say this, this is the era of trigger warnings and safe spaces and stuff. Occasionally, I bring stuff up that, that, that uh, steps on people's personal uh, Things that not good things. I, mean, I, I forget what I told you guys about the, the plane crash. But did, I t did I tell you the plane crash story? Yeah, yeah. So, so, but anyway, so, so people occasionally they have burst blood vessels, arteries, for example, and the arteries tend to burst on the outside of turns where the pressure is highest. Okay. So. All those effects are real. The air undergoes this, this crazy change in pressure where it's got high pressure on the outside, low pressure on the inside of the turn. You OK with that? Questions about that? Um, I can show you these crazy pressure changes. And I'll, you know, rather than dwell in the, in, in the view graphs and stuff, which is all, all in the book, let me show you a couple of them uh, to, that, that, that they are real. This is a you know, hose connected to a high pressure source of air. It's a compressor somewhere else in the building. And it's going to shoot out the end of this open hole at the end of this plastic plate. And by itself, that's going to be, a, when it gets out here, 
when the jet gets out to about here, it's going to be at atmospheric pressure because it's surrounded by the air and it can't sustain any pressure. But it's going to have converted its pressure potential energy into kinetic energy. So, so it'll be fast moving air. And I can just show you that, you know, there it goes. Okay. If I put this plate up against that plate, at first, when I first come close like that, this jet of air shooting through the open space where the pressure is atmosphere will collide with this surface and spread out. And it will create for itself its own diffuser then. And the pressure in the middle will rise above atmospheric pressure, and it will blow that plate away. And you've seen this sort of thing happen countless times. You know, it's, it, it, it wants to. So, so far, pretty, pretty ordinary. But if I bring this plate up very close to the surface, there's a little pin to hold it from sliding this way, the air will suddenly find itself in a, in a case where it makes a bend, and then it goes between a very narrowly spaced gap between the two plates. And when it does that, it has to speed up like crazy because the air's got more air behind it. To, to take its place, it has to sort of go through, it creates a nozzle. So there are bends. I mean, is this exactly related to that? Not directly. But, but if, you, if you make the air speed up by forcing it through narrow passages or around the inside of a turn, the pressure really does drop. And the pressure in that gap where the air is bending around and squirting very fast through the, through the gap, the pressure will drop way below atmospheric pressure. The consequence of that is there'll be low pressure between these two plates, lower than atmospheric, and atmospheric pressure will push the two plates together and they will stick. You can follow the, the, the logic behind this? We start with high pressure air, we have it turn all of its, you know, a huge fraction of its pressure potential energy into kinetic energy, you get through that narrow region, and it actually goes below atmospheric pressure, and we get sticking. So, They're now stuck, held together by low pressure between the two plates, even though I don't seem to have any source of low pressure. It's, it, it happens. Turn off the pressure, they unstick. You okay with why that happened? Or ask me questions if, if that's still confusing. Okay, um, another case where that happens. Uh, This is this same idea, high pressure air coming through, shooting out that hole. And if I put a round object in there and make a gap where the air has to speed up to get through the crack, it has to convert pressure potential energy to kinetic energy, and it loses pressure, and it actually goes below atmospheric. Come back here. I'll show you a more complicated story that we're going to have. It's going to take us a time, a little while, to make this make sense. Right. That that's a little in our, in our future. That story, um, but got to do the fun stuff anyway, right? This one's more relevant. What I have here is a bottle, of, you know, container of water with a, a, a straw essentially in it. At the top of the straw is a domed opening. And I'm going to blow air across that domed opening. Let me just show you what, the, what I mean by a domed opening. So here's the straw going down. And the top has a round part here. Here's the rest of the straw going down. And when I blow air across that domed opening, it's going to, there are essentially nozzle effects for it. And it is going to have to speed up. We'll see, we'll see more, about that, more about that. This is also a little in our future. I'll come, so so I'll, I will come back and show it to you a, a second time when we understand it better. But again, you're going to get a drop in pressure at that top as it goes around the corner. You can think of it also as the inside of a curve. We're going to send the air around a curve. And the inside is low pressure of a curve. Is that right? You okay with that? I mean, that's, that's what's up there. The inside of that turn, low pressure. How low? Well, it can go below atmospheric. 
And if the pressure, so I'm going to blow fast moving air around over that dome. And as it goes over that dome, the pressure on the inside of the turbine is going to drop below atmospheric, in which case we've got now a straw with water at the bottom and less than atmospheric pressure above. It's not somebody's mouth sucking the water up. It's this curving flow of air that's, that, that's sucking the water up. And the, air, the water will go up into, the, into that airstream and spray. And see whether this doesn't look vaguely familiar. <laughs> I can plug it into the gas outlets. You know, I got any choice here, right? Somebody get a match, we'll all explode. Okay, so here's my source of, of, of air. A stream of air, if I blow that air across the opening, can you see the stream of, 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 of the mist come out? It's a paint sprayer or a perfume bottle, the old fashioned, you know, la la, la 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 la, you know, those, those things, right? They take a puff of air, they blow that air across a domed opening and suck perfume or paint or whatever into the stream and blast it out into space where it gets atomized nicely. Ooh. Too fun. All right. You okay with why this happens, more or less? Okay, we'll come back to it too, because we're, because that curved shape is like a ball. And that's in our future is talking about balls and air. This thing's all about balls and air. So we'll, we'll get there. All right, but the main point I'd show you is that these pressure changes in flows are real. That if you, make, if you force flows to, to, to accelerate, basically uh, a, a crucial observation about this is notice that, that, that you get high pressure on the outside, low pressure on the inside, fluids accelerate toward low pressure. It, it, you push hard on this side, don't push hard on that side. <laughs> you, stuff goes towards the, the low pusher. That's what's happening here. I got gravity out of the picture by working horizontally, although this is projected vertically. It's, it's supposed to be taking place on a horizontal surface where gravity isn't important. And the fluid is going along here would go straight if it could. That's inertia. But it's pushed so that it accelerates by a High pressure on the outside, low pressure on the inside. That's a push towards the inside. This, this flow is being pushed toward the center of the turn. That's, that's what turns are like. If, you, if you're driving down a road and you want to turn left, you accelerate not directly toward the left, you accelerate toward the inside of the turn. If you're going on a carousel, you accelerate toward the inside of the turn the whole time. That's, that's the circular motion. Accelerating toward the inside of the turn is a, is, a, is a theme that goes everywhere in the world. So here, acceleration toward the inside of the turn is, is, is uh, forced by a pressure imbalance between high pressure on the outside, low pressure on the inside. OK? Any, any thoughts? No thoughts. All right. Uh, at this point, then, I want to go. I'm, I mean, a nozzle has this, these effects. That you can look at that in the book. It's nothing new. Uh, okay. When you open a faucet, you often hear noise. In steady state flow, where you can't see the, the passage of time, there's no noise. Because noise is initiated, and hopefully we'll get to talk about sound, by surfaces and things fluctuating, variations. Our sound is all about vibrations, motions that, that go back and forth. And in steady state flow, there's no observable motion. It's silent. So if a faucet is making noise, something's happening in there that is not steady state flow at all. And what it is is the tumbling the, of, of water, in this case, that is not, uh, it's not laminar, does not have streamlines. It is the swirling white water that you, that you see, say, on, on a, on a fast-moving stream with rocks in it. You see that tumbling, turbulent water. So that's turbulence. So you see, uh, another example is when you stir your coffee. And this is actually relevant in a minute. When you stir coffee with a spoon or tea or whatever you're stirring, um, <laughs> your other cocktails, uh, shaken, not stirred. If you, if you go very slowly, not much happens. The spoon just goes around and around, and the things sort of move a little bit out of the way, and then they come back together. 
and you basically have laminar flow in your cup. And that's not very good if you actually want to blend things that are different. You know, you cream or cream or whatever with the coffee, you, you stir fast. And the reason for the stirring fast is, as we'll see, you get a different kind of flow around that spoon. It, you might think, well, wait, the fluid's stationary, the spoon is moving, is that a problem? No, it's a matter of perspective, really. I mean, whether a fluid moves past, whether a fluid moves past a spoon or whether a spoon moves past a fluid, it's the same thing. It's sort of a matter of who's, you know, if you're walking with the spoon, the spoon's stationary. Okay, so when you stir fast, you get turbulence, and you, you've seen it in your coffee or, or whatever your drink is. You see the, these swirling eddies and things, what are known as vortices, shapes that, that don't show up in laminar flow. So that brings us to the story of, of laminar versus turbulent. Laminar flow is very simple, orderly flow. There are streamlines, which means that if you put drops of, flu drops of ink into your fluid flow upstream, and you, you can watch them go in an orderly fashion out of, out of view, and they will stay at, with, with some, uh, s some reasonable spacing between them. They, they may get wider apart at times. They may get closer together. We've seen the changes in spacings of streamlines in, in the context of that turning, that bent hose. But the point is still that if you start the drops nearby, they will end up, they will leave the story nearby, more or less. It's just a matter of how, how nearby, in the same neighborhood. That's laminar flow. Turbulent flow, uh-uh. Turbulent flow, you start the drops nearby at the beginning, they get ripped apart and go all every which way. And knowing where one drop ended up tells you nothing about where the other drops ended up. That's the main thing. They, uh, you know, how, how a, how a the scientist deals with it, is, is there's a loss of relationship between, between the uh, adjacent drops. They're, they're, they're taken to arbitrary separation. You can't predict one from knowing where the other one is. And that would be what happens. If you, if you put drops of ink in the lazy river, wherever it is, you can watch the drops go pretty much as long as you've got patience. If you put those drops into a turbulent white water situation, they're just shredded. It's all, you, you lose them. What distinguishes whether you get one or the other? And the answer is viscosity versus inertia. Viscosity, it turns out, is the great organizer and orderer. This viscosity tries to keep adjacent portions of fluid nearby because it fights relative movement. It doesn't like them going near, you know, rubbing across each other. It wants to keep everybody together. I'm trying to think of some family analog. It's, you know, some, somebody's great aunt. Everybody's got to come to the reunion. Okay, so that's probably gender. I, great. Yeah, got to be gender conscious. I, I, it wasn't an aunt. It was a aunt, uncle, other. Okay, I, <laughs> I'm not hostile. I'm just goofy. All right, so um, uh, so viscosity is the great orderer. And viscous, very viscous systems tend to stay laminar, like honey. It's hard to make honey become turbulent because it's got so much viscosity that all the patches tend to move together. Okay? What's at the other end? Inertia. Inertia is the great disorder. It, inertia is about like this patch of fluid wants to go that way because that's the way it's been going, and this one wants to go that way. They won't talk to each other very much. They can rip apart. And so, Inertia favors turbulence. Viscosity favors laminar behavior. Can you, can you get some feeling for why that's the case? So everything that favors viscous linkages between the fluid tends to promote laminar. Everything that favors inertia tends to promote turbulent. And Oswald Rem Reynolds came up with a, a number. It's just a number in the sense that it has no dimensions. It's not meters per whatever. It's just a number. And it's, it's composed of four pieces. The density of the fluid, how many kilograms per liter. The structure, the, the size of the structures that are going to, to interact with this fluid. It's going to, uh, a fluid that's flowing in open, in, in completely open area is not going to go turbulent. It's, there's nothing to sort of start it. But if you start putting obstacles like rocks in the stream, for example, those start to give 
viscosity a challenge in trying to keep this, the flow organized. So the, the size of those obstacles matters. Uh, and finally, uh, over here is speed, how fast the flow is moving. And down at the bottom is viscosity. So this, this Reynolds number is, is, is designed so that, and, it, and when, you, when you do all this calculation, wah, there's no dimensions left, no meters, no kilograms, it's all cancels. So Reynolds number is designed so that if the number is big, inertia wins and the stuff goes turbulent. If the number is small, viscosity wins and the stuff stays laminar. And so putting viscosity down here in, in the numerator, denominator, makes sense because the bigger the viscosity is, the, less, the harder it is for the stuff to go turbulent. So that lowers the number, Reynolds number. Good. Density favors inertia. Density is about mass. So more density, more inertia, that, that, that favors turbulence. So put it in the numerator. Obstacle length. The bigger the obstacles the fluid has to go past, the more likely they are to cause trouble. So that goes in the numerator also. And finally, speed. The faster the fluid is moving, the harder it is to get its attention and make it bend with its buddies and its neighbors. And so the point is that everything that, that favors uh, inertia is, is in the numerator. Everything that favors viscosity is in, is in the denominator. The Reynolds number gives you a value. And it turns out that value is a pretty good predictor of whether this flow is going to be turbulent or laminar. And a rule of thumb, not to be taken too seriously, value for the Reynolds number, at which, which distinguishes likely to be turbulent from likely to be laminar, is 2,300. Do you have to remember that? No. But you should just at least re recognize and remember that things that, that favor inertia are going, to make, are going to favor turbulent flow, tumbling, messy stuff. Things that favor viscous flow uh, will, will encourage laminar. Vi the things that, that, I said that wrong, things that favor viscosity, that lower the Reynolds number, uh, in any case, tend to favor laminar flow. Is that okay? Where is this relevant? Uh, we will see that, that in, in things having to do with air, by and large, objects of, of ordinary size, a ball, us, a car, moving through air, again, whether the, air, whether the object moves past the air or the air moves past the object, eh, it's a matter of opinion. Who's, who's doing the moving? It's a perspective issue. The point is, air has a very low viscosity. You've got a very low viscosity. That is not good for, letting, uh, for viscous dominated flows. It's bad. It's bad for laminar. Flows in air tend to be turbulent. Be, you know, just say it once cleanly and make sure you, Air doesn't have much of an ordering effect in its viscosity. There's not enough viscosity to order things. You get turbulent flow all the time. Is that okay? You've seen it. You've seen, this is when a car drives down the street and uh, in the leaves, you know, fall day, you see the, the leaves <laughs> every which way. That car is just creating a huge turbulent flow around itself. And the leaves are, are sort of mapping out the turbulent flow for you. Is that okay? Uh, the other end, uh, at high, re uh, low, re low Reynolds numbers, honey is all about low Reynolds numbers. It's got so much viscosity, it's really hard to make the stuff turbulent. You could, if you stir honey, it stays laminar anyway. You gotta go really fast to get, uh, to get honey to go turbulent. All right? Yeah? How does heat affect the Reynolds number? Well, heat has a very tiny effect on density, but a more significant effect on viscosity. So there are a lot of fluids that are temperature sensitive in their viscosity. You heat them up. Hot honey flows a lot better than cold honey. You're making it easier for the molecules to sort of ungrip each other and let go and flow. So you could heat, given that, it's, it's not going to change obstacle length. It's not going to change speed. Your, that's your flow. So. Uh, typically, the Reynolds number is going to increase with temperature because the viscosity, the loss of viscosity is going to dominate. So dropping the viscosity. Um, so hot honey could conceivably go turbulent a lot easier than cold honey. All right. Um, I, I put in the book, I'm thinking about heat, 
put in the book the, the, the tidbit about motor oils. You all will, you know, if you have cars, which is most of you, and if you service your cars, which I hope is most of you, uh, and you change your oil periodically, in the old days, you used to have to change your oil not only very often, you know, not, not often because it got contaminated by wear and tear crap in the, excuse me, wear and tear stuff in the, uh, in the, in the oil, but, but, but additionally, with temperature, the viscosity of oils, ordinary oils changes. When it gets hot, the oil becomes less viscous. And when it gets cold, it becomes more viscous. Well, what, you know, what problems does that present for a car? Well, the point of the oil in the car is as a lubricant between surfaces. That's the pr primary uh, purpose, the, your engine oil, is to keep things from rubbing against each other. And they want the right viscosity for that oil. If it is not viscous enough, it will flow out from between those surfaces and allow the surfaces to rub. So it needs some viscosity to keep it in place, some syrupiness. However, if it's too syrupy, now it's sludge that you, your poor engine has to keep moving and doing work against, and it's going to waste a lot of your energy, your lousy gas mileage. So the viscosity of, of motor oil is, you know, there's a target range. And in the old days, that range was hard to get, achieve with one oil in both winter and summer. So what do you do? Well, you had winter motor oil and you had summer motor oil. You changed the oil. In the summer when it's hot, you used a more viscous, fundamentally more viscous motor oil that would, even in hot weather, would have enough viscosity to, to, to lubricate and not leave. And in the winter, you shifted to a lower viscosity motor oil that didn't turn into sludge on a cold day. Modern oils are these multi-grade, you, you may have seen multi-grade oils. They're, they're carefully engineered to have a pretty steady viscosity over a broad temperature range, and that's no, that's no small feat. That is by itself kind of a, wow, they managed to pull that off. All right? So you have it easy. You only have to, you know, you only have to change your oil rarely. Okay. On to other things last bit and piece of, of sort of the oddities of fluids. Uh, steady state flow is an extreme example of nothing's changing. Turbulence, well, stuff's changing, but, it's, but at least it's going on and on and on and on. But what if you really start and stop flows? Starting and stopping flows has all kinds of interesting issues in it, a lot of them having to do with momentum. If you start a, a flow going, you have to give it momentum to get it moving. So there's a transfer of momentum involved in getting fluid flowing. And there's also, when you stop a fluid, there's a transfer of momentum stopping it. And one of the more interesting cases of, of these momentum transfers is, what if you have a, f a flow of fluid moving through a pipe that has a, a valve at the end, and you abruptly close that valve? So the flow, the, the, the flow thought it was in lovely steady state flow and that would go on forever, and bam, you close that valve. Well, the whole column of, of fluid upstream of the valve is going to have to come to a stop. It's going to, and it carries momentum with it, momentum toward the valve, and it's going to have to come to the valve somehow or other, give away all its momentum, and come to a stop. And in doing that, it basically hits the valve like a hammer. It's, and this is, so it's called water hammer. And um, it hits the valve, it comes to a stop in a if you, because fluids, you can't sort of push on fluids with forces, you have to do it with pressure. The pressure surges upward right there at the valve. So you get a pressure difference between high pressure at the leading edge of the of this slug of water passing through the pipe and much lower pressure at the back. So there's a huge pressure gradient that pushes backward on the water, slows it to a stop, you know, deceleration, acceleration opposite its velocity and brings it to, to stop. But that very, that surge in pressure at the front end of this slug of water passing through the pipe can do interesting things. First off, it can shake the whole pipe. So, so some of you may have houses where this is, this is you've noticed this. Um, the, the case that I'm most familiar with is, is when washing machines are cycling water on and off, say during a rinse cycle. They open the water, they close the water. They open the water, they close the water. Whenever they turn off the water, the water that was heading toward the washing machine through the pipes suddenly has to come to a stop. And it can shake the pipes. So if you have, if, if, if this is familiar for some of you, surely, that when you're doing laundry, you hear the pipes rattle periodically. Anybody? 
You, know? you, can, you can fix this problem by including an air pocket in the plumbing, and they usually do now. Uh, with the air pocket there, the water, instead of coming to a complete stop instantly, it, it pressurizes that pocket of air and sort of bounces off of it more gently. It's like putting a cushion in there to keep the, the impact. There are stories, maybe apocryphal, I don't know if ever, anyone's ever done this, but this, this is, these are the stories, I'm only going to quote them. Um, they're all approximately the same, that a dorm decided to, to test out water hammer one day, so everybody opened their faucets uh, just prior to the, to the toning of the campus clock or something, the bell. And at the moment the bell toned, everybody closed their faucets. And the water that was moving through the water main at high speed to, to hit, the, hit this sudden closure and broke the water main. Okay? So in principle, you can do this. All right. I won't do that, but I'll do stuff like it. So this is a, this is a, a demonstrator for water hammer. It's just a glass object, sealed glass object with water in it. And water hitting things doesn't make any sound, does it? Eh, ah, come on. Water hitting a glass makes a sound like that. What's happening is, here's the slug of water. I accelerate this object downward fast, down fast. And when it, when it accelerates downward fast, the water gets left behind. The water's got inertia, so it, it, it drifts. If you could watch it in slow motion, the water would drift up in the glass. Is everybody okay with that? There's air up here, and it traps that. That air gets compressed as the slug of water goes up to the top. And when I stop accelerating the glass down, about, about here, the water pushed down by the compressed air begins to overtake the glass and hits the bottom. When, when it reaches the bottom, it hits with, with momentum and, and a sudden surge in pressure. And you hear that. That's the ting you hear. So can you understand that? I accelerate the glass down, and then I stop accelerating the glass down. The water gets left behind and then catches up with the glass and hits. So far, so good? Well, it's not the weekend yet, but you can prepare for the weekend now. So this is Diet Stewart's root beer, which conveniently has a top that I can screw back on. So it's not root beer anymore, of course. The root beer is long since enjoyed. And now it's refilled with water right up to about here, right into the neck. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to accelerate the glass down. Same idea. The water, being inertial, will drift up into the neck of the bottle and compress the air up there. So far, so good? When I stop accelerating the bottle downward, the water pushed downward by the compressed air will overtake the bottle and hit the bottom. Very reliable. Somebody else want to do that second bottle? Chickens. Come on. So, so I've seen, you can do this with a bare hand and no seal on the bottle, but you end up with a lot of donuts on your hand. I've never succeeded in doing it, but I've seen people do it. So, so, so your job here is to hold the bottle tightly, because you don't want it to fly out of your hand, and wrap it nice and hard on the, on the top. You, you heard it, you can hear it hit. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> See, nothing up my sleeve. I, one last point about this is it doesn't matter what the motion, the velocity doesn't matter of the bottle. It's all about acceleration of the bottle. The bottle has to accelerate downward and then stop accelerating downward and let the water catch up. And I've seen, I was checking out a grocery store one day and a woman pulled a bottle out of her cart and she clipped the counter on the way up to, to put it on the, on the belt. She clipped th that. That's still a downward acceleration that, that, that's fast for a moment and then stops. And the bottom of the bottle blew out. And she was just like, oh! <laughs> but he could explain it. So next time that happens at the checkout counter, you know where it's coming from. <laughs>